want to, wel I want to welcome everyone tonight. Uh, I'm Dave Lerner. I'm the Director of Entrepreneurship here at Columbia. Uh, it feels really wonderful to welcome you to the Columbia Startup Lab. Uh, it's pretty, pretty amazing. Columbia, I like to say that Columbia has not been downtown since 1754. <laughs> so it's, it's good to be back here. Um, and uh, it's great to see so many folks, so, so many of our alumni here so many of our current students joining, and so many members of the lab. Uh, we, we have a great conversation for you tonight, and when I was thinking about it, I was saying to myself, we hear so much these days about entrepreneurs in TechCrunch saying, I raised my seed round, isn't that amazing? Uh, but that's not what tonight is about. Tonight is about the story of an entrepreneur and the venture capitalist that backed him and about the long haul, about what it's really like through that grind year after year after year from a seed round to a series A, a series B, and a series C, the ups and the downs, and what it's really like, and what are the nuances involved, and how the relationship evolves, and try to give you a sense of what really goes on through that long haul. Um, so, I'm going to introduce my colleague, Will Porteous, and Will is going to introduce James Candelaria. Um, Will is the general partner and chief operating officer of RRE Ventures, which is an institution here in New York. They've been around since 1994. They're on their sixth fund. They have over a billion dollars under management, and they've had uh, exits galore of household name companies. Will is on the board these days of BuzzFeed, Connected Data, and Spire. Uh, perhaps most uh, appropriately for, for tonight, given that this is a Columbia event, uh, many of you know Will is a, a beloved professor at Columbia Business School and teaches the epic course that everyone wants to take on venture capital. It's the Venture Capital Seminar. Uh, and he's been doing it for 12 years. Uh, so. It's really great to, to have him joining us tonight. Um, another thing I want to say about our, our friends at RE that a lot of people may not know, they've actually funded and hired more Columbia alumni than any venture fund in the world. So that's something to know. It's a true. So let's give Will a warm Columbia welcome. Thank you so much, Will. That, that is very gracious of you, David. Thank you very much. And, and you know, from the first, uh, when Stuart and I began teaching at Columbia in 2002, David was one of our biggest supporters and one of our, our really best friends on campus. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing to see how far Columbia entrepreneurship has come in the time we've been involved with the university and, you know, this space. And, and what Richard Witten and David are trying to do to bring to the university is a real testament to the university's commitment long term to helping Columbia entrepreneurs build great companies. At RRE, we're just happy to, do a, to be a small part of that. Um, so, but thank you for the opportunity tonight. When, when Richard and David approached me about talking uh, in a context outside of the classroom, um, I, and they asked me what I, what I would want to talk about, it was sort of obvious um, because to me, the, 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 the best thing I get to do in the classroom is tell stories, and in particular tell stories about the people who build our companies. And so when this opportunity came up, the first name that came to mind was James Candelaria, uh, who I had the good fortune to uh, invest in uh, beginning in 2010 uh, in a seed round and to work with through uh, almost five years. And just to give you a bit of context, um, Today, if you were to ask major players in the technology industry, the people who are running EMC, NetApp, uh, Hitachi Data Systems, that division, anybody who's building a really innovative storage company, you know, who, who are among the, the best people around solid state storage technology, James's name would always be in the top five. Now that's a true statement in 2015. He's one of the best known guys in the industry for the innovations that he brought to market through Whiptail. I was fortunate to know James Candelaria before he was a famous storage industry guy, back when he was a guy with a product, with a deep understanding of what his customers needed, and he was trying to build a company. 
And, uh, and really, it's his story tonight that, that I want to I wanna make sure we tell you and, and honor you. So please welcome James Candelaria to Columbia. Um, so we're, we're going to go into a, a, a couple of different chapters in the history of the company tonight. Um, but to start, James, why don't you just give people sort of a short history of Whiptail from, from when you started it, kind of some of the big highlights all the way through to, to, to the outcome and kind of that'll, that'll give people some context for where we're going to go. Yeah, absolutely. Great idea. Um, so yeah, Whiptail was actually founded um, initially as a um, uh, product development inside of a consulting firm where I worked. I worked with uh, my co-founder, Edward Redbolts, um, at a company called The Admins out of, uh, based out of Summit, New Jersey. And um, you know, every single one of my customers had the exact same problem to a T. Um, it was the storage performance was not adequate for the new workloads that were being brought on by uh, virtualization, both server as well as virtual desktop. And um, this, uh, this, this challenge was, was really interesting to me because I, as a systems engineer, I hate problems, I hate blunt hammers trying to fix problems. And that's what all we had available to us was just add more disks to our existing storage array. So um, you know, at this point, since 2007, NAND flash was just starting to become a word that people have heard. Um, it wasn't in the data center yet, um, and it wasn't in the data center for very good reasons. It had fantastic characteristics on one end of the spectrum, horrible characteristics on the other side of the spectrum. But I looked at the problems that it had, and I took a look at those with a critical eye and realized that's something we can absolutely solve um, with, uh, with some actual, some decent amount of software engineering. And um, you know, we took that, took that idea and ran with it for a little bit. Um, and that problem, um, you know, we made a proof of concept. I still remember seeing my good buddy Jeff uh, Sudam at Admiral, who I know you talked to a number of times during the diligence process. Uh, brought him in a rough box, you know, a Linux machine with, uh, you know, stuff full of flash drives and a custom software stack. And um, we proved our point. We proved our point. We ran his query in his database query in two hours instead of 24. And how much money had you raised at that point? Absolutely zero dollars. And, and did you have a company? Nope. And we weren't even looking to build a company, to be honest with you. We thought it was something to serve our, um, the, to serve our customers at that point. Um, but it then it started to dawn upon us that we had to, if we wanted to take this to what its true potential was, we had to independently, uh, independently finance it and independently allow it to grow, which is when we started with the, um, you know, raising uh, an angel round. Um, and um, I don't know about, I mean, any people in the room have gone through funding uh, finance uh, exercises before, but raising money, uh, and Will hears me say this a lot, is the most painful thing I've ever done, especially during the angel round. Especially from me. Oh, uh, yeah, you, you, you didn't help the process much. <laughs> but, um, no, we, um, so we, we did the angel round financing, and, you know, you're doing dinners, um, you're, you're taking people out to dinner, you're, you're explaining your product, you're pitching your product, and you, ha you hope to walk away with, you know, a big score would be ten, twenty thousand $20,000 from an individual investor. Um, but those things kept the lights on for quite a quite amount of long period of time. Um, and then it started to evolve. We started to get some traction. We started winning accounts we had no business winning. Um, and um, you know, we decided to uh, start uh, attempting to go after institutional capital. And um, you know, we were lucky to have met um, a gentleman by the name of Raymond Wong over at um, uh, Spring Mountain Capital during the angel financing round. Um, and um, you know, he started to dig in, and then uh, we met you. Um, I guess uh, it was pretty early in the process. Um, both Brian, myself, and um, Ted uh, Reppoltz uh, showed up in your office um, and um, kind of tell me what you thought. Well, so <laughs> um, this was 2010, and I had done a lot of stuff in the storage industry over the years. And, and as an investor, I love the storage industry because it's one of those markets where the appetite for innovation is still considerable, right? Data volumes growing at the exponential rates that they are. The, the complexity of the systems that are managing all that storage continues to go up. And so we see this cycle where major storage companies that have great distribution networks and great client relationships can't innovate fast enough to keep up with what their customers actually need. And so they continue to look outside of the company for, uh, for new technologies that they can onboard. And it's made for a pretty robust M&A environment for storage companies. And Whiptail was a beneficiary of that. So, you know, that falls under the heading of, you know, investment thesis that, that, that we pursue. I was introduced to James and his colleagues by a, um, a Columbia entrepreneur, a guy named Amal Sarva, who I had backed in a pre private previous company. And uh, it was really in the context of, hey, these guys are doing something interesting in storage. 
you're one of the few people in the New York area who looks at storage deals. They're one of the few New York area storage companies. You should see it. And, uh, and that was kind of it. And, uh, but they were working on solid state. And I knew that solid state technology was going to be this big inflection point across the industry. I also knew that I did not know much about it. And uh, when they first came to see me, the thing that was obvious to me was that they knew a lot and they were testing their ideas with customers. And, and so it was frankly, uh, it, it was very easy for me to, to say, okay guys, I, I think what you're doing is kind of interesting. I want to learn more. And I want to learn more. And I want to learn more. And so for a period, uh, over a period of about six months, we had a, an extended conversation about how their product was working, what they were seeing in the market, the kind of problems that they were trying to solve. And, um, and you know, we started to give feedback and, and we started to really like a lot of what they were doing. We started to recognize that what James had been doing, mostly on his own, for the preceding several years in terms of building this product, was actually really, really bright. That it was one of the best architectures we'd ever seen for a, for a high performance storage product. Anyway. Yeah, so I mean, we, we exited that meeting, and um, you know, honestly, as, uh, as entrepreneurs go, we, we thought we were pretty, uh, we, we, we didn't think we killed it, um, leaving, leaving that meeting. I remember thinking, all right, well, we, we might have gotten these guys interested. But then they dug in, um, and then they didn't leave, <laughs> which was great. Um, and many sandwiches later, um, um, so there's a steli. Um, we actually did uh, quite a bit of catering from whenever they would come by. Um, and um, it actually ended up getting written into one of our term sheets that uh, it must all be catered, all the board meetings must be uh, catered by the Melbourne Deli. And um, so I have many sandwiches later, um, RE agreed to, put, uh, to, um, uh, to invest in our seed round. Um, and then uh, obviously uh, we started picking up traction from there. You know, institutional money um, has a way of focusing you, at least it did for me. I felt a deep obligation to, um, to our investors to um, show some type of value out of, the, out of, um, out of their investment. Um, and I felt the same way towards the angels, but for some reason it was a little bit different um, when we realized that our game had to be raised, because all of a sudden we're now we're swimming in with the sharks, we're not sh swimming with the guppies who haven't gotten past that, uh, that hurdle. Um, so yeah, we started winning some accounts, um, and then um, you know, we did uh, our follow-on uh, Series A, our, our true Series A round. Um, and um, you know, the, the growth path kind of started moving like this very, very quickly. Hit our B round, um, and um, we uh, we had some issues um, uh, somewhere along there. We'll probably talk more about them later. Um, and then in our Series C round, we raised money from Strategics. Um, we raised from both Cisco Systems as well as Sandisk Ventures. Uh, we were actually Sandisk Ventures' first actual um, true um, uh, venture capital investment. Um, and then Cisco Systems took an interest. We had no idea why they were interested at the time, um, and um, you know. We poured gasoline on the fire pretty big on, in the Series C, and um, you know, towards the tail end of um, you know, the, uh, uh, that process, Cisco um, expressed an interest in acquisition, and they eventually ended up buying the company for $415 million. So that's the story, roughly. Um, so we're going to go into a couple, a couple chapters, and the, the really the important place to start is really before there was a company. Um, you know, one of the things that sort of we love to see in, in the entrepreneurs we back is just a really deep understanding of the problem that they're trying to solve. Sometimes it's a consumer problem that they've just obsessively thought about. Sometimes it's a situation like James's where they're confronted over and over again with a customer problem. But James, let's go back to that time before there was even a company, right? You were working as a systems consultant for the admins. You were doing virtualization installations for your customers. You know, you had a full-time job, right? So why, you know, why suddenly decide to start hacking together a product, right? It was the obsessive compulsive nature that I get when I, when I see a problem that, I, um, that is, is actually solvable and, is, and it's being attacked in the absolute wrong way, right? I mean, the existing incumbents were doing it wrong. Um, and that's something that would come back to, you know, that phrase would come back over and over again because it was just... You shouldn't be throwing the same, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. That's what the incumbents were doing. Um, and we had to look at a different, uh, a different animal. Um, and um, so I always focused throughout the Whiptail's entire life cycle, I always focused on solving that customer problem. Um, and, uh, you know, we thought that, um, you know, if we continue, if we actually solve the problem better than everybody else, um, we'd, ha we'd have something. And then we'd determine, 
where we take it from there. Initially, like, like I told you a hundred times, this was never going to be a company. This was going to be a product that our consulting uh, firm sold. Um, but it ended up being, um, thankfully, much more. So there was that moment. Early on, when you went from being a project to a company, when you went from working on your own on something to solve a customer problem to having co-founders yeah. and angel investors, was that a con how conscious was that moment? And, and, and was there a point of no return? Yeah, so the, I think the point, of, uh, the point of no return for us was when we realized um, that it was just, we're never going to be able to, to, to feed the animal the way we, need, we needed to under the existing capitalization structure. Um, you know, we realized that this was taking a lot of my time, and I was a principal in the, in the um, consulting firm, and uh, you know, I literally had a full-time job. I was working eight to 10 hours a day there, and I was working another eight to 10 hours a day doing this whiptail thing. Um, and uh, we realized that unless I uh, got out of the consulting end of the business and worked full, uh, more full time, I won't say full time because it wasn't, um, when I worked more time on, on the whiptail project, would it, would it succeed? Um, and uh, I think that the genesis really was, didn't hit me until we were in the uh, filing the first patents. Um, and the um, stock market dropped 700 points that day. And I realized raising money is gonna be fun. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about raising money, something that <laughs> most entrepreneurs have to put up with at, at some point in time. You had angel investors, you raised money in Boston, you raised money on Sand Hill Road, you raised money from Seattle, you took money from Strategics, you had money from us. So, you know, highs and lows. Start with the lows, or mostly lows. Yeah, so um, like, like I said, so raising money, my least favorite activity in the world, because it took me away from the stuff I was good at, which was technology and, um, and the product itself. But it was a necessary evil. So, um, you know, first thing we did was everyone thinks venture capital. They think Sand Hill Road, Bay Area. Let's go. And we're doing a tech company. We've got to go to the Bay. So we did. Um, and unfortunately, we found out really quickly that um, we walked into the Bay Area venture capital firms with two strikes already against us. Number one, um, we're on the wrong side of the country. Number two, um, I didn't. I didn't have a Stanford degree, and I never finished my undergrad. So it didn't. Um, you know, it didn't bode well for those conversations. I walked into a number of those, um, number of those meetings and um, literally was almost dismissed out of hand as of, who are you? They really just wanted to hear the idea to kind of, I think they were just using it as a sounding board to see what, what people were working on uh, more often than not. So Sand Hill Road was, was kind of my least favorite place. And we actually did, I mean, I joke, but we actually did have some good way down the road with a number of them. But it was just, it en ended up being incompatible. Their belief structure was incompatible with ours. So um, we, mutually, we mutually decided to part ways in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. um, Boston is a particular story I'm fond of in Boston. Is, um, I flew up to Boston, um, and I had to go to Amsterdam the next day to do an install at a defense agency in, uh, in, uh, in Holland. They were already a big customer, if I yeah. remember right. Yeah, well, they, actually, they, hadn't, they weren't a big customer then. Um, but they were, we were putting in the demo units uh, mm -hmm. at that point when, before we displaced the major incumbent. And uh, we got that big PO that I came and busted into uh, the office while we were doing board prep to show you the, the million dollar purchase order. Um, but yeah, I was going over there to do the POC work. And they um, literally, um, the VC firm had a partner on video conference. And they had a partner um, in the room. The partner in the room who I thought we had on side, thought he was, was a believer, um, the guy who was on the video conference literally dismissed us out of hand after flying, after flying all the way up to see him, dismissed us within five minutes, hung up the video conference, and the partner in the room left, just simply left the room. No one showed us out. We didn't know how to get out of the building. We wandered around, <laughs> bumped, into, bumped, into our, uh, bumped into doors. It was insane. <laughs> so, um... You know, there's, there's that period in the life of every great company where you're kind of, you're, you're kind of in the wilderness, right? And, and you had your founders, your co-founders your co rather, and you had a couple of conversations going. You have better stuff happening with customers than you did with investors. And, you know, there was a point though where things began to change. Was it when you raised your seed round, you know? Yeah, I think, that's, I think that was it. I mean, it's one of those things, I think the timing co coincided, but I also think the recognition of institutional capital was huge for the customer accounts we were, we were working on. Um, and, and being able, and getting in front of other, uh, getting in front of other investors, it's, it's you know, kind of a, uh, you know, a badge that says, okay, well, you, you were good enough to get here, we should probably look at you further. Yeah, and so I was, I was in one of those conversations. I certainly wasn't the only one. And 
I was watching James execute. He was going out there, he was getting product installed, he was bringing home purchase orders, and he, I knew that he was the prime mover in terms of this, this company. I didn't know, I didn't see enough else there to really even call it a company. It was a guy with a great product and some co-founders. And one of the toughest conversations we, we ever had was, was really around the subject of, of leadership because I knew that if we were gonna do this, this storage deal in New Jersey uh, that nobody in the venture community had ever heard of, that people were dismissing out of hand on Sand Hill Road, I knew that if we, we, are, if we were gonna do this deal, we needed some kind of, some, some kind of protection. We needed, we needed an insider from the storage industry to help us get this through because James, for all his standing today, the irony of it is that at the time, nobody in the storage industry knew who he was, and the storage industry is a pretty insular place. And so we started trying to identify talented executives in the New, York, in the New Jersey area who could potentially help the company, partner with the company, be advisors to the company, or potentially even be new leadership for the company. And I had to say to James, I said, what you're doing is great, but you're not financeable in the eyes of the market. I remember it very clearly, um, and um, it was one of those things that you know, I actually discussed with one of my best friends, Jason Swingle. We went on a rare trip away, for, I was away from the desk for about 48 hours. And I, it was the, you told me on a Friday, Thursday or Friday, um, I got in my car, we drove the Blue Ridge uh, Parkway, Skyline Drive, um, hung out for a while, and we ended up talking it over, and I realized as I was going through my emotional um, you know, attachment to what we had created, I realized that you know, it's not going to go anywhere without without institutional investment. We can't we can't bring the idea to fruition, and we're ahead of the curve now. Um, but if I if I attempt to try to bootstrap this uh, on my own without institutional financing, uh, the incumbents will be all over us, or another startup will take will 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 grab the uh, you know ninety percent of the pie before we get anywhere near the finish line. So I um, you know, I kind of made peace with those uh, with those emotions and said that. Uh, you know, I'm going to have to um, give up uh, give up some control to um, you know to kind of reflect well. And thankfully, it was the right decision because Dan and I have become lifelong friends, and um, has been a um, have been an, it was an amazing experience overall. But at the time, it wasn't something I was really able to to um, process very easily. Well, I'm I'm very grateful that you made that decision, and and that decision was was similar to so many decisions you made over the life of the company, where you, you, when, when other entrepreneurs might have acted selfishly, you did what was best for the business at times when it went giving up control. I've often said to people, Whiptail succeeded because James gave so much away. And he did. He gave, gave it away to recruit great leadership in functional areas, to bring aboard investors, to bring aboard strategic partners. Um, and in return, we were able to grow a, a, really, a really great business um, as a result. So there was hiring Dan, and then there was the whole business of building the team, right? It wasn't just Dan, it was head of marketing, it was head of finance, it was all, all of that stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, I, and again, once I made peace with those emotions over Dan, I realized that I'm like a lot of people. I like doing things I'm good at. I hate doing things that I'm not so good at. Um, and I realized I'm, no, I'm not an accountant, I'm not HR, I don't do well product marketing. I do love to do pre-sales, but only in the pre-sales engineering role. So I realized that we had to hire key talent in those areas. And uh, I was very thankful that, you know, the fact that you guys were across the river was so good for us, because you, me, and Dan sat around that table hundreds of times, you know, screening candidates, trying to find what are the right characteristics to bring on the appropriate, um, you know, heads of these, uh, these areas. And, um, you know, that was one of those things that I thought was, uh, you know, very, very valuable to me as an entrepreneur is having access to those talent pools. Because like, like you said, I didn't have the Rolodex. I wasn't an insider in the storage business. Um, so, you know, I was a consultant who was good at his job um, and was a very good systems engineer, but I didn't have the Rolodex and the contacts and the networks that I needed to hire for these positions. So you also had a board all of a sudden. You had investors, you had board members, you had board meetings. It went from being your company to a company where decisions got made. Sometimes you were in the room, sometimes you weren't in the room. What, what was that like? It was tough. I mean, it was one of those things, again, it was emotional, right? I mean, this company that you know, I started um, you know, back in 2007, we did the first work on the, on the product. And um, you know, all of a sudden, you know, institutional money shows up and 
management gets one seat on the board. And um, I'm not the CEO, so that seat doesn't go to me. Um, the good news is that uh, Dan and I formed a very close working relationship immediately. I think we, uh, we realized we were going to be good friends during the due diligence process, to be 100% honest with you. And um, we, um, we ended up um, being eye to eye on just about, just about everything. But I think the board was really, really good uh, for me personally because I uh, got to see the company through a couple different lenses um, that I didn't have access to before. So I got to see it through your lens, which was uh, the venture capital side of the equation. But our, one of our other board members was, uh, came from um, private equity. Um, and those guys had a very, very different lens um, than you were looking at the company through. And I really got an opportunity to see kind of the whole spectrum of, you know, build it, or, uh, build it versus operate it almost. Um, and, then, and then what we wanted to do with the technology side. I think those three, those three viewpoints were valuable to me um, as a, uh, you know, kind of as, I guess, uh, as being, being sidelined, it was great to kind of at least be able to see that. Well, you were hardly on the sidelines, though. I mean, what, what, what happened as a result of this is that James was able to focus his, his energies on things that he's extraordinary at as a CTO, as product lead, as for a long time head of engineering until we handed that off to someone else. Every major product release was passing through him. And so the, the innovation curve in this company continued to get steeper and steeper. Whiptail shipped what may still be the fastest production storage array ever as a result of the, of the fact that we, we built this company o over a five-year period in which James just innovated, innovated, and innovated on this architecture. And so I, you made great decisions from a principal standpoint to give up control, but it also freed you up to do the things that you were great at, which, which made us all more successful in the end. Um, let's talk about growing the company. Let's talk about good times and bad times. Uh, because there were plenty, plenty of both. Uh, what were some of the good times that you? Oh man, there's, there's there's a lot. So I mean, the first taking the first purchase order. I mean, that that's key, right? So I'll never forget the date of my first purchase order. Actually, no, it's, it wasn't the first PO. It was the first install date, but it was February fifth, two thousand and nine. I remember that day because my wife's birthday, and I wasn't there because I was sitting in a data center in Raritan, New Jersey, installing Whiptail 001 inside of the, a customer. Um, but so that was one of the, one major highlight. But um, as we started to grow the company, those, you know, good times, you know, um, are somewhat intoxicating. I mean, you get win after win after win, and you know, the business is accelerating like this. We had an opportunity, um, and you remember, you guys discussed uh, going for tonnage at uh, one of the board meetings. Um, and um, so Max, and who was our um, uh, head of marketing at the time, hatched this crazy idea. Um, to, do a, uh, to do one of the trade shows that we were already going to attend, we did, decided to go for a big booth, um, and we decided to hire somebody who'd be a huge draw to the booth. And um, we hired Brent Spiner um, from Star Trek. We hired um, a Lieutenant Commander Data um, to be our booth, uh, our booth person for, uh, and sign autographs and talk about the product. Which was awesome because he was a uh, he was a boyhood idol and um, you know you I know got, a lot about data. Yeah. I do. We know a lot about enterprise <laughs> data. I mean, come on. so it was it was fantastic. It was one of one of my really favorite times. Your venture money to hire celebrities yeah, to promote so your product. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you said go for tons. <laughs> you, you did indeed. Yeah. What, what what were some other good times? I mean, you had customer wins. You had big partner wins. Had, yeah. I mean, we had stuff happened, like we won intelligence agency contracts. Um, you know, we're this tiny little firm in New Jersey, and uh, you know, we're, we're walking into DC and data centers I can't speak of, and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, so we also, you know, we won um, some crazy, um, you know, uh, you know seven-figure deals that, um, you know, we took directly out of the pocket of the incumbents who were willing to give it away for free just to not lose footprint. When, um, one of my favorite sayings that uh, one, of my, uh, one of my early hires always says, we beat free. You don't beat free very often, um, which was kind of cool. So, uh, you know, we, we had definitely had some fun times. Um, and, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, good comes the bad. Uh, yeah. You know, we had, um, we, we, I guess this was right around our you know, tail end of our Series B. Um, we grew the company way too fast uh, from a headcount uh, perspective. And when you're doing things like hiring celebrities and whatnot, it's easy. sometimes it's uh, pretty easy to think the growth is going to continue like this, um, and that's going to convert to revenue. Um, and um, we missed. We missed bad um, in one of our quarters. And um, we had this uh, challenge. Our burn rate was way ahead of plan, and um, we had to make a tough decision. And um, as, a, uh, as the founder of the company, um, you know, having to do a layoff was probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. 
um, simply because you know, I asked all of these people to join me um, based on my vision. I probably internalized this a little bit too much, but you know, I, I personally hired almost everybody at that firm at that time. Um, you know, I was in, I was in the interview, uh, you know, I was involved in putting the, um, uh, putting the offer letters together, and um, I had to tell them that, you know, it was, you know, it just wasn't going to happen much longer. I mean, some of these people were, were not right for the role. Um, some of these people, the roles just tended to outgrew the person. Um, but it was the right thing to do. I think the most um, impactful thing about that process, though, was the support we had from our board. I mean, so, you know, a lot of times I've heard stories and uh, some of my friends who have raised money on, from other VC firms in other parts of the country, they'll remain nameless, but they're on the other side of the country. Um, they, um, you know, their board, you know, give, gave them an order, they had to cut the burn rate, and, they, the, and then the board disappeared. That wasn't the case with this, uh, with this situation. But you were also facing having to raise more money. And you were also watching not just early employees, but you were having to come to terms with sort of the changing nature of your relationship with your co-founders, too. Yep. And it's worth spending a minute on the, the co-founder experience when you go through a period of intense growth and how your relationships change. Yeah, I mean, it's really tough. I mean, people you've worked with for a long time, you consider personal friends. Um, you know, the business can, uh, can move out from under them. Um, and it's something that they, hard for them to come to grips with as much as it is you. Um, and it becomes a, um, it's a really challenging position to be, have to bring somebody like that into, into your office and tell them, you know, this just isn't right for the company any longer. Um, and it's gut-wrenching. Uh, there's no two ways about it. But, um, you know, I've always, I've always tried to do the best for the company, um, kind of despite the cost. Um, and um, it's, you know, cost me some friends. Um, I, I won't say otherwise, but it was, um, it was the right thing to do. And then out of nowhere, y you get summoned to San Jose, right? <laughs> you should give a little context on your working relationship with Cisco, what they were starting to do with the product. Yeah, so Cisco, I mean, um, for those who don't know, the world's largest networking company, they didn't have any investment in storage at all uh, until, they, until they pulled the trigger on the Series C. Uh, they put in, uh, I think it was two million, it was one million, two million, something like that, in the Series C round of financing. And um, these guys, um, you know, we were kind of, we didn't understand why they did it, but we were, you know, we thought it would be great. Um, we thought originally it was around integration with UCS. So they have a server component, um, uh, server product line, uh, known as UCS, and they were big in virtual desktops, which is what we were big in uh, for accelerating virtual desktop storage. Um, and so we thought that was, that was their interest. Um, so we started doing a bunch of stuff with Cisco. And then, um, you know, we, uh, me, Dan, me and Dan get a phone call from our um, corp dev guys uh, of Cisco who led the investment. And uh, we were essentially just summoned to San Jose. We weren't really asked. Um, we, were, we basically were given 48 hours to show up in a conference room in San Jose. We weren't told who was gonna be there. We weren't told um, anything much else about other than it's an important meeting, you need to be here. I said, okay, you guys invested a significant amount of money, we'll, we'll go. Um, so we walk into the conference room and across the table from me are Mario, Luca, Prem, and Sony. So these people are the, um, you know, the legends of Cisco. Uh, these are the engineers that they spin in and spin out. Um, you know, they spin out, um, then they go out and they, they buy their, uh, the company that they formed um, back for a billion plus dollars almost every single time. These are the guys who did NCMA, these are the guys who did UCS. I mean, the list is very, very long. Um, and um, so at first, I'm in a, bit of, a little bit of awe. I'm sitting across the, the table from legends that, you know, I kind of idolize. But then they start ripping my product apart. <laughs> and they start telling me, and they start, and they start telling me, you know, this, you know, these design choices aren't right. And I think the mouthpiece at this point is Luca. Um, and, um, you know, they keep telling me the product's not right. It's never going to work. It doesn't work like that. And at first, I take a couple punches, and I'm like, you know what? You asked, for my, you asked me to be here. I will, I will tell you how I feel. So I defended our product, um, and I start to see this little kind of smile on the edge of um, the corp dev guy's uh, uh, lips, and still have no idea what I'm doing there, other than um, just getting beat up by uh, some of the smartest people I've ever met. And, um, you know, we, and I think I'm starting to make inroads. These guys are starting to see things my way, or at least realizing that I'm not uh, a complete idiot. And um, as quickly as um, you know, we get to that point, um, we get dismissed. Notice I, don't, I say, don't ask, not ask to leave, just dismissed. <laughs> yeah. 
And um, so we get, on a, we get on an airplane, fly back to New Jersey, and we have no idea what to make of it. Um, you know, we're just like, okay, I guess they just wanted to double check their investment committee and make sure they didn't make a huge mistake. It's really, all we, uh, it's really all, all we came to. So you just went back to closing deals, growing the company, hiring people? Yeah, we, yeah, we went back to you know, business as usual until um, a few months later, Cisco plops uh, their general manager and uh, their CTO of the UCS division into our office for three or four days and wants to talk about you know, doing more with Whiptail. And I say more with Whiptail because we've done um, you know, some, uh, some co-marketing and so co-branding events. We hadn't done any real technical integration with them yet. So I thought that's what that was about. Let's do an OEM deal, let's, you know, let's do this, let's help you sell the product, put it on the price list, et cetera. But um, you know, again, still not smart enough to put two and two together until uh, <laughs> they leave and go back to San Jose and we go back to business as usual. Um, I guess until uh, we get to um, kind of July, I guess it was, of that year, we get the, we get the phone call um, that um, Cisco had an indication of interest. But you, you've probably got more on that than I did because I didn't get the first phone call. Well, <laughs> it, was, it was one of those things that, you know, I'd been hearing from Dan, uh, the CEO, that, hey, you know, things are, this conversation with Cisco is becoming more intense. And they're looking at ways that they can use this product to really drive growth in what is their already their fastest growing division, fastest growing, most profitable division of Cisco at the time, UCS still is. And so, okay, that, that all sounded good. That sounded like real strategic interest. I also heard a lot of you guys getting you know, flown out to the West Coast, oh wow, that sounds exciting, and then nothing. Guys showing up in your office who sound like they're pretty important, and then nothing. And so, you know, as a board member, you kind of get used to these ebbs and flows and strategic interest, and it was nice validation that we knew you were working on something really important that could be valuable to some other, other part partners, and so I was able to sort of turn to my colleagues at RE and say, well, you know, they're, they're paying a lot of attention, but we don't know how this is gonna go. And then, uh, you know, they, they did make a formal indication of interest in the company, and the board and James immediately sort of came together. And, uh, and we worked, I'll, I'll, I'll always remember this because I was on vacation with my family on Long Island, and I was in, in a, uh, a motel in Long Island, and I didn't go to the beach the whole, like, three days I was out there because I was on whiptail phone calls kind of six, seven hours a day because we were actually going back and forth with the team trying to, trying to perfect the deal and get to, to an agreement. And it all happened very, very quickly. And then there was a long, long period until October when the deal was totally confidential and not announced in the market and we were, we were working to get it closed. And getting a deal signed and getting a deal closed were two totally separate things. Very different. Because even a small company like Whiptail with a limited operating history your acquirer wants to look at every contract. They want to understand the terms on which you part a company with every employee. They want a, a, a deep, confident understanding of your, your cap table and, and that sort of thing. And so you're kind of forced to go back and make sure suddenly that every mess has sort of been cleaned up in the right ways. And so we were doing a lot of that and paid a lot of accountants uh, a lot of money uh, in the end. Um, so, you know, that, that brings us to October and the acquisition of the company and, and maybe, you know, James, give people some thoughts about what it's like to see your company and your, your product get acquired. It's, it's a mix of emotions, right? I mean, it's one of those things that, um, you know, you have complete and utter control. Um, at least I had complete and utter control <laughs> over the product development and the technology of, of what was going into Whiptail. I mean, th and the board, I can't say this enough, gave me complete artistic freedom when it came to that. If there was a technology I wanted to build, I could build it. Uh, my R&D budget was only constrained by, you know, how much money we had in the bank. Um, and, um, you know, th that was fantastic. Um, watching, I was watching the company get acquired, I realized that that was going to change rather quickly. Um, so, it, while it was, you know, amazingly validating um, to have the company bought, it was very, very scary. The good news is we got bought by a fantastic group. We got bought by the best business unit at Cisco, right? Um, so uh, you know we had, we ended up getting a lot of keeping a lot of our um, our own uh, control of our own destiny. But um, you know we had uh, you know, things definitely changed when you move to a move into a larger firm for sure. So, looking back at the journey, rewrite the story. What would you do differently as founder? 
Oh man, um, that's a good question. Uh, I'm a firm believer in, uh, you know, um, your experiences make who you are today and get you to the point uh, of everything uh, forward. So I'm not sure I would change a lot, but my, my next, if my, on my next venture, I know what I'm doing differently. Uh, <laughs> I, um, I would definitely hire a CFO early, um, even pre-financing, right? I mean, you need, um, and you saw this, our cap table and our, our books were just not in a place where it was easy for you to decipher what was going on. Um, and you know, having that cleaned up could have probably cut some, a lot of time off the diligence process, I'm sure. So I would have had that done. I would have hired a internal recruiter much, much earlier than we did. We spent so much money, um, and uh, you're aware of how much we spent, it's almost embarrassing on hiring the engineering team. But when you have to hire a bunch of engineers in New Jersey, um, it's not easy to do without a recruiter. Um, so I would hire an internal recruiter. Um, and lastly, I probably wouldn't put my wife through complete and utter hell for five years by starting a family simultaneously when starting a company. Fair enough. Um, so, so that's the whiptail story uh, told between James and me. Um, we'd be happy to take any questions from, from the audience at this point, if there are any. Let me just, so, so we can be sure everyone heard that. Did, when you got the offer, did you engage in a process? Did you, did, you, did you go out and shop the company at that point? How did you approach it? Yeah, I'm not sure how much uh, latitude we have on discussing that, uh, that process. Okay. Um, so we, we, um, we had a no-shop agreement um, before, we, uh, before they made an official offer. Um, so um, to hear the offer, we had to agree to a no-shop. Um, and um, you know, we, uh, we took that risk, and the board deliberated on that for quite some time, on whether or not we were going to sign a no-shop before, uh, before we decided to hear, hear what they had to say. We actually were not shopping the company um, at all when we got the indication of interest. Like we didn't engage um, uh, investment bankers to sell the firm, so it wasn't like we could, uh, you know, we could point um, to a ton of uh, ton of offers that we had on the table and shop it immediately. It would have had been a very active process, but we thought it was in our best interest because Cisco was the most attractive acquirer in the space um, because we all knew that they'd be hiring the team, and uh, we'd all have to live there. Um, so we wanted to ensure that we went to a place that uh, you know, the engineers and the team wanted to be. Um, so we thought, that was a good, we thought it was a good way of doing it. If I could just add, it, w it, was, it was really tough as a board, because you ba we basically had to make an assertion that we probably couldn't get a better price with an equally high likelihood of closing the deal. We knew that the Cisco guys we had a very high close rate on stuff that they committed to. And we were pretty confident that we could get the deal from a starting point up to a level of value that would be pretty, a pretty great outcome for everybody. But there was a lot of sort of, you know, shouldn't we be out talking to other people? And, and we, we really deliberated over that for a long time. But ultimately, I think one of the most important things about the Whiptail story and about Cisco's decision to get involved with the company is that the table was set for this, right? It wasn't, I mean, yes, the indication of interest kind of surprised us when it showed up, but we had a working relationship in the field. Cisco salespeople were selling more Cisco product when Whiptail product was involved in the engagement. We were doing joint marketing activities together. They had become an investor in the company. There was this long period of, yeah, this stuff really works, and yeah, it can really help us. That, that made the business case um, and would have made the business case, I think, durable if the deal hadn't come together. And what I mean by that is, you know, public companies walk away from acquisitions all the time because their stock takes a dip or that sort of thing. What was clear was that Whiptail and Cisco were gonna be doing business together. And that, that made it something we were comfortable with. And frankly, we didn't have that relationship with any of the other strategic partners that we were working with. We had some, some beginning things with VMware and good things with SanDisk and, uh, good things with other players, but nothing like that. So. Other questions? Yeah, right here. So the question was, what, what, what was the thinking both on management side and on the investor side to open up our books to a key strategic partner? And, and what would have been the implications if then the deal hadn't gone through? This partner would know everything about us. Well, I, I didn't see it as a huge risk because they were already a board observer, right? Paul, um, you know, our, um, the GM of the UCS division, was already a board observer, and um, you know he had a, access to a lot of information already. I mean, the financial information was ancillary. I don't think 
Now, I don't think they cared what our revenue number was. I think they cared about what this could do for Cisco's business uh, being attached. So I, I, I wasn't concerned about that, but you might have a different idea. I think if the company weren't in a strong position, I would have worried about it more. I mean, you, you definitely worry about scenarios where a business is deteriorating and you know you need to sell it and you expose the financial performance of the company to would-be acquirers and suddenly they basically look at your balance sheet and your burn rate and they set their watch. And they say, okay, we'll call again in six months when you're basically out of cash. And if you're not interested, we'll wait in the parking lot and hire your five best engineers. Right? Like that, that plays out all the time. Um, but in this case, what we knew from working with them in the field was that they wanted us to be successful. And we also knew that we were operating in a really hot space which, with what was probably the best product at the time. And so Wibtail was a company that had options. It was, it was, it was burning too much money uh, in the spring before we sold the company, but it was clearly going to be able to raise additional financing and it would have been appealing to other companies. And it was, you know, while revenues weren't totally predictable, we were closing big deals. And so it wasn't like we weren't in business. It's a good question, though. Um, others? Yeah. So um, I'll repeat the question is, why did we raise, why did we continually raise, and for what purpose were we, uh, were we raising capital for? Is that the genesis? Yeah. Okay. So um, you know, we were continually in fundraising mode because we, we realized that we could attack more market segments faster um, by hiring a sales force um, to focus on those particular verticals um, uh, quicker. Product development actually was ironically the least expensive part of it. Um, you know, we, we hired in that, in that area, but it wasn't, we weren't raising for that. We were raising for marketing. We were raising for um, you know, pre-sales and sales activity. Um, but those, uh, you know, those were really the, uh, the use of the assets. Is Unless you, because, sorry, is that because that's basically your core strength, the product development side? I mean, I, we ran a lean engineering team, um, and um, you know, I was willing to work you know, 18 hours a day if I had to. Um, um, but you know, I would have, um, you know, it was also hard to find talent. It was also very, very hard to find um, storage engineers in New Jersey. Um, so uh, you know, we, we probably could have spent more money there, but we, um, the opportunity and, uh, and talent pool just wasn't readily available. We, we were also in a race. Uh, I mean, we were, we were in, in this category where there were a, a number of well-funded companies with credible teams. And when you're, like, when, you're, when you're in this market where there's a lot of technical uh, evaluation of the product, everybody in their product literature and in the way they talk about their products appears to have everything. And so, you know, we're in major accounts alongside companies like Pure Storage and, uh, God, I can't even remember most of the names of these players. Cominario. And, like, and we knew that they didn't have anything, but a lot of customers didn't know that they didn't have anything. And so, we, being here in New York, for instance, we, we really wanted to claim a lot of early market share in financial services. And Dan, our CEO, had been the, the the head of all of storage technology for Morgan Stanley at one point. And so we had a, this baked in advantage in all these relationships on Wall Street and the banks and anybody who was going to try solid state we thought was going to try our stuff. Well, to ex execute on that, we needed to raise enough money to really blanket financial services and, and have a lot of account coverage. Um, it was stuff like that that drove a lot of the fundraising. Um, yeah. But, um, so the question was um, really the thought process around um, taking institutional money instead of continuing to um, uh, pound the street um, uh, for uh, additional angel investment. Um, we knew um, pretty quickly that um, you know, an institutional money would give us a stamp of validation to get into accounts. I mean, that was, that was, the, big, that was the big thing. Um, the secondary um, uh, thought process around that was that, um, you know, Going after angels, um, $25,000 at a time, um, is very difficult, um, time consuming, um, and is one of those things that is just not a fun process um, uh, to do it, uh, you know, a, a drib and a drab at a time. I, but I can't say enough about our angel investors. You know, they gave us life when, you know, there was, there was absolutely no assured return. Um, you know, they were, they were blindly believing in our personal relationships, uh, personal relationship and um, the limited information that we gave them at an investment dinner. Um, so, I mean, the angel process is incredibly important, um, but when you, uh, at a certain point, you have to outgrow it, I think.
You know, the, the, the world has actually come a long way with respect to the structuring of angel rounds, even in the last four or five years. And I think there's a lot more, um, there's just a lot, a lot more good tools today, like safes and good convertible node structures that there, there wasn't even enough of when, when th these deals were done. So there were just an awful lot of small convertible debt commitments, separately documented, documented very inconsistent terms. I mean, the company had basically been kind of raising money, and, and a lot of companies do this, and it's not a bad way to go. They had been raising money kind of on a rolling basis. And so um, you, you often hear people say, you know, when you're a CEO, you're always raising money. Well, James, as a founder, was always raising money, and he was raising it in twenty-five dollars and $50,000 chunks. And that was sort of keeping the bank account going while he was writing products, while he was doing everything else. And there comes a point in time where you've got to convert all of that convertible debt and everything else, and, and hopefully you have a catalyst like a major round to do it. And so the first financing for Whiptail and there's, was a cleanup financing in some respects, where we converted all those notes, every, all of those angel investors, their, their commitments were honored and their equity was honored and everybody got the piece of the company they were supposed to get, but we had to sort of sort through all that and convert it. And we got out of that a pretty clean cap table, a, a clean understanding of who owned what. Um, and it, there's always, in the life of every company, there's a cleanup financing of some kind. So. Yeah. Well, you know, so the, the HP autonomy deal, I think, you know, it's all about price, right? At the end of the day, they paid a huge price for that company. It was a bet the company kind of decision. And I'm by no means a, a, an insider. I, I have read the public stuff that, that other people have read. I think. Um, Whiptail was very much a product company. The services component that it sold was really around installation services, support services, long-term maintenance. And that's very typical of hardware systems companies. So not, a, not an enormous portion of the revenue, probably 15 to 20 percent, would you say, was services overall. So it was pretty clear what they had. But this, in many respects, we were very fortunate around who acquired us because Cisco is an acquisition machine and they acquire products and they, you know, the, the, the revenues that the company had were validation that the market wanted this, but they weren't a reason for valuing the business. The reasons for valuing the business the way they did really had to do with the potential for what could happen inside of Cisco. And so the business case was really built around that um, for doing the acquisition. There was not a big earnout associated with this deal over time. And um, the thing about escrows and earnouts is they tend to be binary. You either, you either hit, hit the numbers and you know, all the escrow is released and all the earnout is paid, or it's the opposite and they take everything. And that's what I see looking at lots and lots of M&A deals. So. David. Yeah, I learned that you need to choose a partner that looks deeper um, and looks and looks at the people um, that are that are involved in it as well as the uh, the product, right? I mean, you could have picked a, you could have picked apart the try to pick apart the technology, brought in a million experts. I mean, I, at one point I got a um, uh, I had to do due diligence with the CTO of AMD um, uh, for Sand Hill Road and uh, VC, and um, I, it's something that. You know, I think was very important was that um, the partners we chose or ended up ended up uh, sitting at the table with looked deep into customers. They looked into the people running the company um, and didn't uh, and weren't hung up on you know um, uh, past um, you know past experience or uh, or validation of you know a fancy uh, grad degree um, or being in the right geo geographic location. You know, proximity was key for us, um, and that really helped our relationship evolve. You know, I felt like I could pick up the phone, and if I needed him, he'd be there in a couple hours. A um, number of times, you were. We did that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it's, uh, you know, in the beginning, um, you know, it's a very humbling experience going through due diligence um, for a VC firm, and we don't really know each other yet, and you're asking, you know, about every single detail, every single decision I ever made. It's kind of a feeling out process. But you end up getting to know each other um, over time, and um, I, I felt like you built, uh, you began to trust in uh, the product and uh, and myself and the team. The more you dug into the diligence process, you know, it, it, it's it's the way we like to work. We like to work with people over a long period of time before we invest. We like to watch them in the choices that they make. We like to try to help them. And, you know, I, I, a big part of 
um, what we try to do as a firm at RRE is be in a supportive mode of entrepreneurs that we like and want to work with, whether we're invested in their company or not. So that, that means helping them find talent. That means giving them our frank perspective. That means blogging about them at times. I blog about companies that we're not invested in just because I think they're doing great stuff. Um, it's things like that. And then, you know, when you, when you get involved with a company, it's, it's taking the journey together as much as you can. Um, you know, there's a, there, there was a funny moment. I was, I was thinking back on the phone calls that I, I, I got from you during that period. And one, one story we haven't told people was, Whiptail was, Whiptail was located in a back office park in New Jersey that was right next to a creek. And after, we were like two months into the deal and there was a massive spring rain and the creek overflowed. And it flooded the parking lot and it flooded every first floor office in this complex. And it flooded out the entire Whiptail team. There was mud from this creek all over your offices, like two, mo two, two months after we invested. You guys were basically homeless for, for a period of time. The engineering team was spread out all over New Jersey and we didn't have a company for a period of time there. No, we had a temporary office space. Yeah, I mean, you know, and, and, it, and you guys didn't miss a beat. You know, and, and the next time I came by, there were sandbags, and you were, you were prepared. So. It's true, but what Will calls a spring rain was really Hurricane Irene, so, you know, <laughs> this is what happens when you live in the city. That's what, that's what it was. <laughs> that's, that's, that is what it was. A little, a little bit more, a little bit more color is, um, so during the due diligence process, um, you know, I'm pitching, I'm heavy into the pitch on the product, and Will's sitting in the conference room, Milburn Deli sandwich in your hand, Very happy. and I, um, and I start to describe Cloud Runner um, to you. And you stopped me dead, dead in your tracks. You said, you said, now you've said the word cloud, you can stop and continue with everything else you're doing. <laughs> and I thought that was cool because you were very direct and honest in the, in some other places I would have had, you know, you would have, uh, you know, um, just tuned out at that point and, um, and kind of, uh, you know, and kind of thought less of what we were doing um, because, um, you know, because I wanted to harp on something I thought you wanted to hear. But um, yeah, that's the type of relationship we have. We're both very honest people. Um, and I think that comes from you know, kind of where we're based. I mean, the New York, um, the, the interaction between people on the East Coast tends to be a little bit more direct um, and uh, something that I subscribe to. Yeah, absolutely, as, as do we as a firm. The last thing I, I want to highlight is that Whiptail is, is, I think, indicative of the, the diversity of company formation that's happening in the greater New York area. In 2013, in addition to Whiptail, we, we also had a, another big outcome in MakerBot. So two systems businesses based in the greater New York area, hardware companies, you know, right down the middle of, of industries that Silicon Valley should be dominating. And those companies were built here. The leader in 3D printing for the prosumer market, the performance leader in solid state drives were, be, were built here. It's indicative of the diversity of what's happening in this market. And, and it's, it's a, the reason at RRE that we continue to invest so actively here. We have 65 active portfolio companies in the greater New York area, and they cover the entire spectrum of innovation. And um, you know, I, Whip, Whiptail and, and its success were kind of a signal event in that uh, history. And I think people, people on the West Coast are waking up. People don't, people don't give the New York area enough credit. I mean, there are a ton of smart engineers here. There are a ton of smart people um, in the greater New York area that um, have got you know, the ability to do great things. Um, and we get discounted a lot. Um, and um, I think, uh, as Will said, I hope the tide is, uh, is uh, turning. This facility here, I was telling um, Dave earlier, this is great. I mean, this is you know, encouraging people to, do, to bring their ideas to life um, on the East Coast and not automatically think you need to relocate to the Bay. Um, this is this is really cool stuff. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of us guys. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, Thank you.